All right, let's go ahead and get started. I want to thank everyone for coming out to Lending Privilege. And I want to start with a story about an actor who several years ago worked on a television show and this actor faced a dilemma. He was the star of a TV show that wasn't doing all that well in the ratings, but that was not the problem. This actor learned that an actress who also starred on the show was not being paid as much as the other male actors. Now this actor was beloved by the fans of the TV show, which gave him a lot of influence. So he went to the studio executives to demand equal pay for this actress. And he was successful. The actress received pay equal to her male peers. The television show was Star Trek. The actor was Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock, of course. And the actress was Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura. Uhur -Uh. That's right, Leonard Nimoy was down with equal pay for equal work way before it was cool. Nimoy lent Nichols his privilege, his gender privilege with the fans and also his male privilege. By lending her privilege, he furthered her position as an actress by giving her access to better pay. Now you may be wondering, what does this have to do with a software conference? Well, you may have heard that software as an industry is not very diverse. Whether it's open source or closed source, developing or deploying code, the people working in software often don't reflect the general population, nor are rewards like pay, promotions, and positions of leadership equally distributed. We face the reality that a woman working today on a development team who has mastered tools like Ruby, GitHub, and SQL has less access to equal pay than an actress who worked on a failed TV show in the 1960s. However, I believe that Leonard Nimoy provided a model for how we can address this problem. Notice that Nimoy didn't wait for Paramount to create a diversity program, nor did he wait for a better salary policy to be handed down by his superiors. Nimoy acted based on his sense of fairness. Nimoy lent Nichols, a fellow artist, the privilege that he had as a male actor, and he helped her participate in the financial benefits of his gender privilege. And I think that there are a lot of Leonard Nimoy's in this audience. And I also think that there are other ways to lend privilege to make technology a more diverse and a more inclusive industry. But first, we have to understand the difference between diversity and inclusion. Let's say you were throwing a party at your house. Diversity is sending invitations to your party. That's easy to do, right? Just pop them in the mail and you're done. Inclusion goes further than diversity. Inclusion is making sure that your guests are not only invited, but also feel welcome at your party. You understand that some people had to make a longer journey to get to your party, and therefore you are a bit more welcoming and being thankful for them for making the trip. Or you understand that some people have food allergies, and therefore you make sure that there are other food options for those guests. Perhaps some of your friends don't drink alcohol, and so you provide non-alcoholic beverages for those guests. That's being inclusive. Inclusion requires empathy. And empathy just means that you take the time to understand that people are different and that you try to bake that difference into your daily life. Diversity is easy to gain with symbolic gestures and meaningless numbers. Inclusion, however, takes real effort, but it pays better dividends in the end. And as Leonard Nimoy realized, inclusion won't come from big companies. It will take a grassroots movement of individual people making changes based on their sense of fairness. Now, since we work in tech, especially 
those of us who work in open source software, we know about grassroots movements. One of the first books on open source software was The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric S. Raymond. In this book, Raymond explored the miracle of Linux. Now, we don't really think about it today because we use Linux and we know that it worked, but back then, Linux was this crazy project where you had this kernel that anyone could contribute to to make it into a useful operating system, and it worked. Raymond began to use the principles of open source software in his projects, and he distilled lessons that he used to write his book. Raymond likened closed source software development to a cathedral where there is a centralized command and control, and he compared it to open source software, which he described as this loud, babbling bazaar where power is distributed among many, many loud voices. And spoiler alert, the bazaar model produced better results. The lesson that is most well known from the cathedral and the bazaar is this. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Now I hope that many of you are familiar with this phrase, but I want to focus on the more, the more formal version of this statement from the book, which reads as follows. Given a large enough beta tester and code developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. That is a statement of inclusion. Raymond linked the size of the code developer base to problem solving. And what else is innovation but the ability to solve problems? If we let, if we let software development and we let everyone into this big tent, this babbling, boisterous bazaar of people who are involved in the development of software and dedicated to making it better, then there's no problem that we can't solve. And that is the promise of inclusion. But the sad reality is that just like our repositories are protected by passwords and permissions, often our companies are protected by privilege. And there are voices that we keep out of this bazaar because we don't create a place for them to take part in our projects and in our companies. Certain groups have a hard time lending their voices to the babbling bazaar that Raymond described because they lack privilege. And, and this is tragic because whatever problem you have within your company, within your source code, or however you ship software to customers, someone out there can fix it. But they are often denied entry into your company. To understand how this works and what we can do to make things better, we have to understand privilege. But before we do that, it's really important that we understand what privilege is not. Having privilege does not mean life is easy for you or that you haven't worked hard. It does not mean you haven't sacrificed or that you aren't good at what you do. Privilege is like riding a bicycle up a hill. It's hot, you're working hard, pedaling, you got this really bad leg cramp, but you're trying to get to the top of that hill. However, some people don't have your privilege, and for them, it's a harder journey. There are things they have to deal with that you don't because you have privilege. However, having privilege does not remove you from the responsibility of understanding that some people don't have your privilege and that their journey through technology is harder than yours. Now, I have gender privilege and I've worked very hard in my career over the past almost 20 years. But working in tech as a male means that I have benefits that I enjoy that those without gender privilege often lack. One of those benefits is being given the benefit of the doubt when I talk about my work. Furthermore, furthermore those who lack gender privilege often have to work harder 
because they encounter obstacles that I don't even think about. For example, I was, I was just walking around uh, downtown San Francisco last night. It was kind of late, but I didn't really think about it. I mean, you know, six foot two, black guy, I work out sometimes. No one's gonna really attack me at 10 p.m. But if I didn't have gender privilege, I probably would have paid more attention to my surroundings. So now that we know what privilege is not, let's define privilege. Privilege is simply access to benefits based on traits you possess. And those benefits could be a variety of, a variety of things. They could be schools, jobs, social circles, leadership roles, and wealth. Now there are two major categories of privilege. The most well-known category of privilege is birth privilege. And that includes traits like parental, racial, assigned gender, and physical privilege. You're, you're born with these privileges and they are enshrined in the DNA that you receive from your parents. And ironically, these are the privileges we don't pick for ourselves, but they are often the root of most bias. The second category of privilege are selected traits like religion, gender identity, and education that we choose as we grow. It's human nature to share privilege with people like us. There's just something in human nature that compels us to help people who remind us of who we are. We like people who are like us. So those who have gender privilege usually share their benefits with people who also have gender privilege. Those who have racial privilege often share their benefits with those who have racial privilege. However, it's far more powerful to lend your privilege to those who lack your privilege. Now, I want everyone to look at these privileges, and it's a combination of selected privileges and birth privileges. And you might have one of these, you might have all of these. So just take a few minutes to look at these, this list. And this list is not, is not, is not uh, exhaustive. Uh, there are many privileges out there, but this is just a representative sample. Now, your portfolio of privileges create a set of benefits that often make it easier to work in tech. And so once you've identified one privilege up here that you have, just think about it in your mind. Again, some of you may have one, some of you may have all of them. Now, once you have at least one privilege in your mind, think about your career in software development. And what would that career be if you started out without that privilege? What if you started your career without your gender privilege, without your racial privilege, without the privilege of going to Stanford or MIT? Or if you didn't even have the privilege of being able to walk around, see, or even hear? How much harder would your journey through software development be without these privileges? Now think about the people in tech, many of whom you work with every day, who are less privileged than you are and have to navigate their careers at a significant disadvantage. You can help remove these disadvantages by lending your privilege. By spreading the benefits you gain from your portfolio of privilege, you increase the value of everyone. Now, I'm sure many of you own stocks or other uh, investment vehicles, and you probably learn about diversification, and that by having a diverse portfolio, your overall value goes up. Well, think of this as having privilege diversification and that by lending privilege, you increase the sense of empowerment that everyone feels. Now, I want to illustrate three types of privilege lending through three women. Let's call them B, L, and M. And those are made up names, but I'm sure that you work with people who are very similar to these three ladies. And for each illustration of lending privilege, I'll describe the type of privilege. I'll give an example that we all can probably know about of how it works. 
And then I'll show how you can do this within your technology companies or on your open source projects. Now, the first type of privileged lending is credibility lending. And that's providing visibility for someone without privilege. For example, LGBTQA people often feel restricted in tech because of the heteronormative nature of the industry. I mean, we're a bunch of, we're a bunch of cisgendered folks in general. At least that's what you see on magazine covers and on TV. But by lending them credibility, you can help them unlock their potential. So here's the example. A few months ago, the Ray McKesson, the noted uh, activist, visited uh, the Colbert Show. And Colbert switched seats with DeRay in a demonstration of credibility lending. Now, DeRay gained the powerful platform of Colbert's chair, which raised his profile. And that is credibility lending in, in action. Now, let's say you work with B. And B's great. I mean, she developed that killer feature in your last release that your customers love. Uh, she's always active in your Slack. Uh, either helping new people who just joined the, the, your, your team, or even seasoned veterans who help them understand that, yeah, you know, we made some architectural decisions and that's why we write the code this way. And she's been a solid member of your development team for a long time. But most of the senior leaders in your company don't even know her name. Well, why don't you lend her credibility by co-presenting that feature at the next board member and the uh, board meeting and raising her profile in your company. And while you're at it, why not offer to fly her girlfriend uh, out to the next company on site since you fly out the spouses of everyone else? Now that's credibility lending. The next type of privilege I want to um, describe is, is access lending. And that's providing entry for someone without privilege. Now, often women in tech, and I've had the benefit of working with great women on tech teams, but often they feel like they don't have male privilege. And so they often feel locked out of being involved in technology because they don't feel the same sense of empowerment that people who have male privilege enjoy. And I think that access lending can be a very, a very powerful tool to fix this. Here's an example. Tracy Chow, who is also a noted activist for equality in technology, once described how one of her Stanford professors insisted that she become a TA at one of her computer science classes. Now, Tracy was very hesitant. She said, well, you know, I'm kind of struggling, and I don't really think that I'm qualified to be a TA. And she often heard her male peers in her computer science classes brag about, oh, the homework's so easy in the labs, I, you know, I just breezed through. But Tracy was struggling. But the professor insisted, and she became a TA, and by doing that, she had access to the grades of those male students, and she realized that they really weren't doing as well as they pretended to be. And so by getting access, she was able to see that, you know what, I'm cut out to be in technology because I'm really just as good as, as, as these male students. Now, how can this work at your company? Let's think about L, who spent the last month implementing your container strategy. She's very sharp. She always answers your questions. She's always available to lend a hand and help solve problems. Well, why not lend her access by sending her to that Docker conference that always begs you to speak? And you don't even do Docker. Why not let her go to that conference so that she too can feel a sense of place at tech events? And while you're at it, why don't you give her that pay increase that you've been promising her for the past couple of years so that she can also get some of that equal pay uh, that we talked about earlier. So that's expertise lending. Let's talk about, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, access lending. Let's talk about expertise lending. That's providing a voice to someone who lacks privilege. You know, people of color, we often don't feel like we have a voice in technology because we lack the racial privilege that a lot of tech leaders have uh, in, in technology. Well, I think that expertise lending can fix this. So let me describe this. I was at South by Southwest uh, back in March and our first lady uh, visited. And while I saw the president's keynote, I wasn't able to see uh, Michelle's keynote, but I saw the, uh, the, the live stream. And she said something very, very powerful. She said that if you have a seat at the table, look around the table and ask, is there diversity 
around the table? Are there voices that don't sound like yours? And, and that's a very powerful example of expertise lending. So let's talk about M. You know, she's one of your best developers. Um, she's always been a solid person. Her code reviews are flawless. Well, why not make her a tech lead? Why not give her the ability to lead and lend her voice to your company and give her a chance to feel like she has a place within the, the leadership ranks of your organization? And also, while you're at it, why don't you show her how to run project budgets? Because that's a key skill that she'll need if she does decide to rise up the ranks of your company. So those are three types of privileged lending. And I hope that you see that there's not a lot of effort involved in this. It's really a set, it's really a change in mindset. And I hope that you thought about other types of privileges that you can lend as well. But I want to caution you that lending privilege is not a silver bullet. It's not something that you try once, it fails, and you throw up your hands, you say, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Lending privilege has to be a philosophy of life. You have to buy into it. You have to buy into that bazaar that Raymond described, and you have to believe that there are benefits to having truly inclusive technology teams. Now, I have to acknowledge that Common's going to be performing tonight uh, at the Benefit Concert for Black Girls Code. I'm excited. I hope everyone's heard of Common. Uh, that might be my black privilege speaking, uh, that I know who, who Common is. Um, Common is known for a lot of hit songs. But one of my favorite songs is from the movie Selma. And this is a song that he co-wrote and performs with John Legend. And the song is called Glory. And the chorus from Glory says this. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. And that chorus and that song captures the essence of why I think that diversity and inclusion are so important. When we have a diverse and inclusive software development industry, it won't mean that women win or gay people win or transgender people win or black people win. It means that we all win. We see this in every movement in our nation's history to advance the rights of the disenfranchised. After a brave Muslim American father famously offered to lend his copy of the Constitution a few weeks ago, the ACLU offered to send free copies uh, to anyone who, who wanted one. So I ordered a copy and mine arrived this past Monday. So I'm reading through the Constitution. I haven't read it since probably eighth grade. And my initial thoughts was, you know, this document holds up pretty well. You know, it's a couple centuries old, but uh, it makes sense. There are a lot of good ideas in the Constitution. And I, I realized that the founders built a, a, a pull request system into the Constitution. Because you can take changes, you can request changes, uh, have them reviewed, and then merge into production, right? These are called amendments. And it's a hard process, right? That's why you haven't had more than 27 uh, deployments in 200 years. Um, but, you know, just like in software development, right, the first version of the Constitution had issues, uh, but there's a lot of meat in the pull requests. For example, when the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was passed into law after the long turmoil of the Civil War, that amendment did not make it illegal to own black people. It made it illegal to own anyone. So as the descendant of black slaves, I'm sure that my ancestors rejoice at that amendment, but all Americans could rejoice because they now lived in a country where everyone was truly free. When the 17th Amendment gave women the right to vote, I'm sure half the population of the country was happy to be brought into the uh, franchise, but all Americans won because they no longer lived in a country where your gender was held against you at the ballot box. And when the Supreme Court recently uh, declared that, that same-sex marriage is marriage and should be protected, well, I'm sure that many gay and lesbian couples benefited but we all won because we no longer lived in a country that put restrictions on who you could love. As a nation, we have tried to form a more perfect union by addressing the wrongs done to people of color, women, and LGBT 
uh, QA people. And I think that we can form a more perfect software industry by addressing our own peculiar problems. When we build the future of software as a place where everyone is welcome, no matter who you are, we all win because we will then work in an industry that puts no limits on talent. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. Now, I know that some of you remain unconvinced, and you don't think that diversity and inclusion are a concept that you should even have to care about. And I understand that. And you may think that, you know, building software is just my ones and zeros, my commits, my pull requests, that's all that I should care about. Now, I don't have any proof, but I would guess that when Leonard Nimoy went into the offices of, of Paramount to argue for Nichelle Nichols to get a better pay, I'm sure that some of those executives thought, you know, what does making a sci-fi TV show have to do with paying a black woman? And I would hope that if Leonard Nimoy was posed that question, he would say it has everything to do with making a sci-fi TV show. Because the man who played the character who symbolized the power of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, I have to believe that he thought that creating an environment where everyone's rewarded for bringing your ideas, your talents, your perspectives, and your passions to making art, that that's something that, that, that is worth fighting for. So I hope that as you build the art of your code, that you too will understand that we want women, people of color, LGBTQA people, and other marginalized groups to not only enter the technology sector, but stay and get promoted. If we want that boisterous bazaar where no bug is deep, then you all have a role to play by lending your privilege. Thank you. And I actually have time for Q&A if anyone wants to ask. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 So the question is, as often the only other in the room or even in the company, uh, in this case being tra transgender, um, how do you deal with uh, at being, I guess, a, a, a activist burnout by always having to be an advocate for your particular uh, group? And I, you know, I'm the only black person in my company and that has not been uh, something that's unusual in my 20 plus year career. And it is hard. It is hard because there's, there was a study a few months ago that being uh, Mono View Culture published a article about just the price that people pay being advocates. Uh, often we, we pay a price with work. Uh, you know, I'm fairly, I'm fairly well known on Twitter as being someone who gives talk about lending privilege and all of the dysfunctions of technology. If I want someone to hire me, that's something that people are going to see. And that's something that I accept people may uh, hold against me. And I may have a certain career uh, options taken away. But I believe in this stuff. And I'm, I think it's worth taking that risk. And it's hard. And I often question myself and say, why don't I just go to work and do my job like everyone else? But Whenever I give talks like this, and I meet here for people like you and all the other people who have come either before this session or after, that's so empowering. And it gives me a sense that I'm making a, a difference, that I'm having a, a change. And so you guys make it easy. Uh, and I really appreciate all of you uh, who come up and say, you know what? You really explained that in a way that I could understand. Uh, thank you. And, or they say that, you know, I'm on a journey as well, and you help me 
make the next step in that journey. Uh, but it's not easy, but I think it's worth it. Kiana, my good friend, how are hey, you? Hey, Amon, how are you? Your talk never, ever gets old, so thank you for being here again. Um, you know, as a black woman in tech, you have lended your privilege to me and you. in your friendship and in other things, elevating my voice on Twitter and other things like that. So I want to say thank you. I think one of the things that is sometimes difficult for people is the how. Right, yeah. and, you, and you definitely um, eloquently said the how. Can you um, maybe give people one thing, just one instant thing that they can do you know, uh, tomorrow or in two days or next week within their company? And maybe their company and their teams are not yet diverse. So, in, and that may be the case, but what's one thing that they can do if, yeah. if they have that issue? Thanks. Right, thank you. Ken, I was asking, what is one takeaway, one action that uh, everyone can take uh, after this. And let's say tomorrow you get to work, uh, maybe Friday, because you'll be, I hope, here tomorrow for the rest of uh, this, this conference. You know, I have found that in my journey as an ally, and I am an imperfect ally, I'll be the first one to, to, to say that, um, my journey started with wanting to understand. Wanting to understand, I understand my own particular lack of privilege, but Male privilege is a heck of a drug in technology. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You get access to a lot of things that women have to beg and plead, or we aren't even told about. And so when I saw, started out with my sisters in tech and seeing, why, why isn't so-and-so here? Oh, you didn't even tell her? Why was she not invited to this? Why, you know, why was she told about this golf tournament? And so I began to just ask the question. And I talked to uh, people like Kiana and other people who I had the privilege of knowing either through Twitter or through just personal friendships. And I, and I sat down and I'm like, you know what? I've noticed this. What's going on? And, and listening, not talking, listening as they told me their journey and then asking, what can I do to help? And a lot of what I put into this talk and a lot of what I try to do um, with my own personal life it's, it's just that, listening and seeing what small, concrete things can I do to help make her journey a little easier. So what you can do tomorrow is, is listen. Find that other within your company or maybe on your team if you're on an open source project and just say, hey, can we go uh, get something, maybe some coffee or hop on a uh, FaceTime or something and, and, and just listen. And then over time, ask, what can I do? You know, you, I have gender privilege, or I have racial privilege, or I have the privilege of being cisgendered. What can I do to help you? And I think that's something that, that you can do right now, is, is listen uh, and be open to helping. Yes. Hi, we met a little earlier. My name is Nancy Duyon. I am a Google employee, actually. I'm running UX for consumer operations. Um, a question that I have is how do you get other people to, um, uh, how do you ask folks to lend their privilege, right? Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is that I really appreciate this talk. I've heard a lot of talks about diversity and I haven't heard one this way where you're talking about lending privilege. And it's also one of those things where you may be talking to an audience, anybody who's here, I'm really surprised by, right? Probably right. is a little already woke to an extent. So how do you yeah. ask <laughs> other people um, to be aware of their privilege and maybe to help you? Or how do folks in this room uh, help their peers also lend their privilege out to uh, and, and participate as an ally in that sense? Yeah. Thank you. So the, so the, the question is, how do you ask people to, to lend privilege, right? I, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking to the choir here. If you come to the session, uh, you're probably farther along on the journey than maybe some people who didn't come here. I have found that my, my approach, the approach that works best for me is to model and then message, right? So I, I model, I'm here speaking at this conference about lending privilege. I do things with coworkers who lack privilege. And by, by doing that, I, you begin to see people wonder, hey, I noticed you went out with so-and-so to have coffee, or you seem to be really advocating, you know, being an, an, an advocate for this initiative. And by modeling that, that helps you to have the opportunity to share that message. Like, well, actually, I'm glad you asked. Um, I have been learning about privilege, and this, this is something I think can be helpful 
And this is something that I think, um, something that even you could do, right? And so when people ask you by observing how you've modeled, that's the opportunity for you to send them message and get them involved, right? So um, it's a long game. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, but that's what I've been able to do to get people involved. It's not really uh, converting people, uh, but it's just showing them how it works and then hopefully getting results. Yeah, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Frank. I'm a fourth year computer science student at UCLA. And at school, um, we organize like hackathons and we have computer science programs for uh, students not even in CS to get into uh, coding. Uh, because right. the younger you start, uh, you know, the more opportunities they will have. And I was wondering, um, as students, how, how, what are some good ways for us to get in touch with uh, companies to have them help us uh, with these events? Yeah, uh, you're in a really good place, actually. Uh, there are vendors out in the main area and I would say, walk up to them and say, hey, I'm a student at what, what, what university? U UCLA. UCLA, there you go. Hey, I go to, to UCLA, is that the, the Bruins? Yeah. All right, go, well, I'm a Texan, so I'm from Texas. Go Longhorns, but also over here, go Bruins. Um, <laughs> um, this is a good time. And when you're at a technology conference where there's support for a talk like this. I'm not sure that support existed even three years ago. I don't know if it's going to be here three years from now. I would say walk up to some of the vendors. You have a lot of big companies uh, in the area. They, they want to hear from you because they want to probably hire you and say, what are you guys doing about diversity and inclusion? And what do you guys think about, uh, you know, say, or I went to a talk called Lending Privilege and here's some things I wrote down. What do you think about that? And you're really very empowered to have that conversation. Uh, because you're someone who most companies, I, I'm, I'm assuming, want to bring into the company. So I will say that you have a voice that is probably more powerful than you even know. And so use it. Absolutely. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. I have time for probably one more question. So yes. All right. Yay. Uh, so I've worked on uh, several different smaller organizations to try and do like girls code and target different uh, different groups. What I've come across on a couple occasions is unwilling for someone like me to actually teach and work with these individuals. Have you ex experienced any uh, issues or times that's happened? And do you have any advice on how to approach that elegantly? Because uh, really, uh, mostly it's from I want to give back and I want to be an ally and all of that. But a lot of people I've heard don't want me standing in front of a room teaching two girls people who are not like you. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how can I be an, an ally when the people I'm trying to ally with view me with suspicion? Is that kind of? Yes. Yeah. I think you have to accept it, to be honest. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about getting more women into technology. I'm really passionate about getting women not only into the field, but into positions of leadership. I'm talking CEO, CIO. Um, I'm not surprised when there's the initial skepticism, because I'm a dude, and dudes do horrible things in technology, just to be honest. And you have to be willing to be patient. You have to accept and understand the hesitancy. And you have to say, you know, I'm, I'm here. And um, over time, as you build relationships, as you act in good faith, then I think you'll get trust. I know I've gotten trust with, some, with certain of the um, women in tech who I call friends. And I understand the lack of belief and the earnestness of my desire to be an, 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 an ally. But you know, that's really my problem. Uh, it's on the ally to align himself, herself, whoever, with the group that you want to help, right? So educate yourself, listen. And by doing that, I think when people see that you're listening and you're talking open spaces about these things, you'll, you'll get more access. But you have to be patient, you have to respect uh, their, their, their concerns and, and just do the, the uh, work. All right, that's all I got. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to come up to me, follow me on Twitter. I appreciate it.